Multigreen, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multigreen Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Norton. And today we'll be speaking with Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Gamco Investors, the incomparable Mario Gabelli. We discuss value investing through both financial and social lenses. Using history as our guide, we explore how to make a profit while also making a difference. Profit with a purpose, indeed. Enjoy our conversation. Mario Gabelli, thank you so much for being with us today on this podcast. My privilege uh, to talk about my favorite subject, which, for which I have extreme passion, that is investing in the equity markets and the, under a capitalistic system in the United States. I love that topic too. Now, I was doing some research on your name. Is it true that Gabelli in Italian is a verb and it means inflection? Listen, the only I, my mother and father, my father was born in Western Pennsylvania. His father died in a coal mining accident. At the age of two, he went back to Italy. They didn't go past the sixth grade. And when they came to the United States, uh, he worked in the restaurant trade in New York City. And she came back uh, subsequently and uh, they both came through Ellis Island. I never asked. Some family members may know it. Good luck. <laughs> well, I understand that you bought your first stock at 13 years old. What was it? Well, what uh, a little more background. I basically uh, was able to caddy initially at Winkfoot. Uh, they didn't have an age limit, and I was bigger than most at the time. Now I'm smaller than most. The markets beat, beat you up. And, uh, bottom line, I then wound up hitchhiking up to, uh, from the Bronx, up to Sunnydale Country Club in Westchester County. And the pro was Whitey Boyd. He had a son, John Boyd, who you know. So I feel I knew him and uh, caddied for him, actually, when he was a semi-pro, assistant pro. And uh, his daughter is Angelina Jolie. So because I was able to go there on my own and come back on my own, I waited around till the individuals came up late in the afternoon to play golf, and they were specialists on the New York Stock Exchange. They talked stocks, and I thought that became an interesting dynamic. So if you carried two bags on a loop and did two loops, one in the morning, one late at night for nine holes, you'd make a sum of money. And uh, <laughs> they were probably a buck and a half a bag. Obviously, that was low at the time, but that's okay. And I wound up buying four stocks, and I can't remember the sequence, Beach Aircraft, it and Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, and one other one, Pepsi Cola. That's remarkable. I hope that I can pass on that uh, tradition of getting my kids into investments uh, that early on. What is the key to start young like that? I, you know, I, I we do have that uh, dynamic. Uh, for example, we just engaged uh, X number of interns from a variety of schools across the country that have, you know, their PhDs. At least I hope they are passionate, hungry, and driven, and. Uh, we uh, told them, open an account somewhere, buy some stock, and we uh, want you to just get in the game and figure out the mechanics of doing it. So what you need to do, and the listeners should do, is say, do you like baseball? Do your kids play soccer? Assuming they like baseball, buy them one share of the Atlanta Braves, <laughs> get them the annual report. It's a public company. The symbol is B-A-T-R-A. It's $26. You're not going to go broke. And uh, basically, they will then become passionate owners and understand that by buying stock, you're buying part of a company and the management and the dynamics that take place. Okay. Great advice. Uh, so that's how they got started. Independent of that, depending on their age, obviously, you want to make sure that they're investing and not day trading. Well, we just came back from Omaha, where we met, and it was the 57th annual Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. And you sponsored your 13th annual dinner, you know, giving of your time and resources. How do you go about selecting the panel for these dinners? Well, let's do it another way. About uh, 20 years ago, I was invited to attend Berkshire. I met Warren because he went to Columbia Business School like I did. But I also started tracking him, Randy, because he owned a company called Pinkerton's. And I was the analyst assigned not only to autos, farm equipment, conglomerates, but also business services and media and entertainment. And uh, because I was assigned to media and entertainment, you know, we basically started hosting conferences. Then about 20 years ago, we were invited to attend a dinner sponsored by, uh, I believe, Morgan Stanley. And uh, as a result of that, uh, three or four years later, Warren said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I called him up and I said, how about my nickel and your guest list, Warren? And he said, no. 
I said, how about my nickel for the dinner, but Columbia Business School's guest list, they charge a, a certain sum, they keep the money and we sponsor that. And that was not very complicated to do. Uh, so uh, the dinner you attended were probably about 300 individuals. The price, however, of steak has gone up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> So when I left your dinner, I bumped into Thomas Russo in the lobby and I asked him specifically one question about Berkshire. I said, Tom, do you know where the best resource for a legal entity org chart would be for Berkshire? I can't find it anywhere. And he asked me to talk to you. <laughs> I don't know if he was kidding or not. Uh, well, we did, Randy, in addition to that, and we picked that, but you know, I like giving money back to Columbia. In part, we give scholarships, we have an endowed chair, but we do that at Miami. We did something, University of Miami did something at uh, just recently at Case Western, Reno, Nevada, and so on, and a whole bunch of schools. In terms of the book, though, we had a meeting that morning on Wednesday, Friday morning. One of the publishers who's analyzed and broken down every annual report into a 700-page book, maybe it's included in that. So we'll get that for you. Well, fantastic. You mentioned in some of the research that I, I followed on you, your aha moment came in the classroom with Roger Murray. You said this is where the sun, the moon, and the stars aligned. Explain to the listeners who Roger Murray is and why that's so significant. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. I was buying stocks and reading the Wall Street Journal and Business Week starting at the age of, yeah, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade. I did it in high school. And uh, we would then go out and uh, buy the Journal American in New York, which is a late evening newspaper to get stock prices. Okay, you either had to go to a brokerage office, there was no equivalent on uh, that was available as is today, we can get instant results 24 hours a day. And so uh, I took an account, I was an accounting major. I had a philosophy minor. I knew I wanted to be in the investment business. I had decided right after uh, Fordham undergraduate where for a variety of reasons. We're a very entrepreneurial place for me. And uh, basically wound up going to Columbia. The first course I had with Lee Koopman, Art Sandberg, and a couple of other individuals was with Roger Murray. And basically, I didn't know what I wanted to do in the investment business, but it said, here's what you do. Read Graham and Dodd, understand security analysis, understand how you can gather the data, array the data, look at the fundamentals, look at a company's uh, annual reports, look at the history, look at the dynamics, and that was it. Randy, it was like, as you point out, very nice of you to call it the aha moment. I like to say everything came together. And I said, I want to do research on public companies as what they call a security analyst. I love that title, security analyst, financial analyst. That's one of, the, one of my favorite titles. It clearly depicts what you're doing on a daily basis. My question to you next is, what is value investing? You sit in the classroom with Roger. We learn all of these um, jargon, margin of safety, catalysts, you know, screening and searching and change, specialization. How would you define value investing? Well, what we do today, and I have X number of analysts that work for us, let's call it 30 or 40 out of uh, 170 teammates on a global basis. We look at an industry. How does that industry react to changing economic environments? What is the company's position in that industry? How does the management allocate cash? So we get an annual report, we get a 10K, which is a document that companies publish annually. And then where they're located and send individuals to go out and visit the companies at their headquarters. So we do, what we do is to dig in and start thinking as to how owners would want us to be interested in the company. How does management allocate cash? What are the challenges? We describe this as a way for an individual that wants to be entrepreneurial to figure out whether they want to buy the business, okay? So large companies like Apple, you, you know, you're not going to be able to buy it. But some companies like XYZ, uh, located in Milwaukee, because it's part of an ecosystem, you can buy it. So the way we define uh, value investing, the economy, you know, if we were sitting here 120 years ago, we'd be 80% uh, farmers, you know, and then all of a sudden you had Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and you had a manufacturing and industrial revolution. Then, uh, you know, we had today an in, uh, a digital revolution. And we're at the beginning phases of that. You started in 1988, 98, 99, 2000, dot com. They, 
and the collapses that happen and the growth that happened and the incubation of ideas. So on a global basis, then you had the Berlin Wall come down in November of 1989. You had Tiananmen Square, and we decided to go global with our research and our stock selection. And uh, so what we're trying to do, Randy, we want to own the business. And, but we own it by buying pieces of the business at a discount for what somebody else would pay for the entire business. And that's what the terminology in the 1930s that were put in by Graham and Dodd was called the margin of safety. And that was it. That's a great definition and a great perspective. And you've evolved. There's now the Gabelli way. And you've created something called the private market value uh, with a catalyst methodology. Can you expand on that? Yeah, that's a great question, but it's also born out of necessity. When I started the firm in 1977, we were bottom of a bear market. Companies were selling at three or four times cash flow. The headline in one of the magazines like Business Week was the death of equities. So we were trying to survive, okay? I was making 5,000 a year down 95% or whatever for what I was making. And I had family members that needed support like food. and. And so we came up with the idea that there's a public company. What is it worth? And so it became the concept that if it's publicly trading, what if you could own the entire company by taking it private from an exchange? Secondly, because I was practical, I had clients, I had clients that were paying taxes. So if you held an instrument for over a year, you would get some long-term capital gain treatment. So we basically said, look, we want to buy a company, look out two or three years, but we also want to see what an element, what element is there that might be surfaced that's public information, consolidation of an industry, uh, changes in the federal regulations, changes in tax structure. And that will allow the stock selling it in the public markets, at, let's say $20, but it's worth 40, that will discount and that element would be a catalyst. So we call it PMV with a catalyst, private market value with a catalyst. It is very hard to do that today with companies like Apple or those other stocks, but you can do that with a lot of companies to figure out what is it worth if I can convince the owners to sell the company and a new set of buyers to own it and have the moral obligations of handling all of the uh, dynamics, much the way Berkshire Hathaway looked at Allegheny and came up with a price of $848.08 uh, by buying a stock that was selling materially lower. What was he thinking? How did he do the analysis? Yeah, those are great points. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned Atlanta Braves. I've always taught my uh, son and my family about Berkshire Hathaway. That is, you know, my gold standard. But you're seeing Disney right now trade at basically 50% of value. Is that an example of a value investing trade or is that not a good example? There are lots of examples. I have my own list that I want you to buy. Uh, you know, you may own Disney and you want me to uh, tout it, but that's not what you're asking. Basically, to look at Disney, uh, my first research report was a Mickey Mouse way. I went to visit them in LA. So I covered the, uh, ga I covered the entertainment industry. So I would visit MCA out there. I would visit Disney. I'd visit some auto parts companies that were located. For example, Earl Scheib was on Wilshire. Uh, Boulevard. And uh, we would then look at how many times can you remarket, repackage, recreate Cinderella. And I think it was like six or seven times and each one had a cycle. So we learned the concept that was very simple. Give to the customer, the consumer on whatever device they want to watch content, deliver it at the lowest possible cost and deliver it on any way they, and any time they want to see it. Fast forward, under Iger, and Disney was extremely uh, well managed. Eisner, Iger, they all did a great job of running it. They've made a, a transition. And so the question is, did Pixar, wow. Lucas, wow, wow. You know, and uh, then they uh, bought Fox uh, because they wanted to sell off that business. And uh, now when I look at content, Tom Cruise is coming. Today is, uh, well, we're talking this week, Tom Cruise, it's hard to believe Top Gun was 35 years ago. Mm. Okay, will that play in the theaters? Doctor Strange, for example, hit significant box office. So when you look at what Disney has coming up, 
and look at the distribution and look at the creativity and the amount of money they spend on content, uh, you say, is this valuable? Then secondly, can people support going to the amusement parks, given the price they pay? Given, is that the experience that they want? Is that they're buying experiences versus goods and services? Shanghai shut down. We have a, a, an analyst that works in our office in Shanghai, covers stocks there. Uh, they're shut down. Paris was shut down. So, you know, you have to go through these cycles. Now, in that context, then you had Netflix. Uh, Reed Hastings has done a terrific job of going direct to the consumer, and that stock went from a dollar to 25 cents. And the question is, is that creating a psychological challenge and a cloud over direct to the consumer? Disney understands this. Reed Hastings and Netflix understand it. Bob Basky at Paramount understands it. Uh, Zaslov at, understands it at Warner Brothers Media. They know what to do. And over the next 10 years, these stocks are going to be very attractive to own. Over the next 10 days, you know, no muss. <laughs> Well, two years ago, thank you for that response. Two years ago, you were here in Las Vegas and you explained to an audience there of wealth advisors of your PPP, list of investment opportunities, highlighting planet, people, and potential. I was not there, but I heard about it. So staying on the theme of P, um, you highlighted the dichotomy of the plastic and you're explaining that concept. Can you share with our listeners today what the PPP list of investment opportunities is and how you look at it? Yeah, Randy, that's a great historical analysis on your part. And thank you for doing the research. But I added a new P recently. <laughs> uh, independent of that, you know, the horrific decision to be made in part because he thought NATO was going to try to absorb Ukraine or whatever the reasons. Uh, when you think about plastics, you think about the 1960s when there was a movie, The Graduate. A generation grew up on listening to Dustin Hoffman hearing about there is a great future in plastic. Well, today, the planet, which is the P, and plastic is a subset of that, needs to worry about climate and plastics. Okay, from a plastics point of view, we have to figure out a way to either bring in aluminum cans that are more recyclable and eliminate the uh, plastic that is consumed by the consumer. And it's going to probably looked at by 200 or 400 years ago for, uh, by people who observed mankind as what the Romans did with lead and created a problem. We have to solve the problem. So as a result of that, I signed an analyst. She went to Vanderbilt, she went to Northwestern, and she's doing our aluminum can work. So that is what companies like Ball, like uh, the one here in Stanford, and uh, so on, there's three of them that we like, and one that is e even a greater bargain uh, in terms of uh, converting and substituting aluminum for plastic. Secondly, we have a teammate who went to the military academy, and Naval Military Academy, and is still a Lieutenant Colonel in the reserves. He's another analyst who covers our recycling companies. And so the notion of taking uh, plastic and getting it out of the system, but also taking aluminum and making it uh, economically viable. So that's the background and that's the plastic. The pa but the real key is worrying about people and the planet and then looking at the potential of all of these substitutes while you're making profits and creating opportunities and allowing American innovation, American inv creativity to unfold unfettered. And that's always a challenge. I applaud you that you've been able to make that coexist. Uh, there's many out there that say that can't be done, but it sounds like you're a perfect example that it can be. No, uh, you, uh, let's make it very clear. We hire PhDs. They used to be poor, hungry, and driven, been privileged, hungry, and driven. But to, in the mantra of the last X number of years, in part thanks to uh, Rick Pitino, who's the basketball coach now at I, that great school, Iona, it's passionate, hungry, and driven. We want individuals to come in every day thinking about 24 hours a day, seven days a week about the moral obligation they have to clients that entrust money to us by understanding every dynamic of every industry and every company that they're assigned to follow. This is not very complicated. I love it. It's a great philosophy. So let's talk about this current market environment for a second. Uh, there's inflation. How does that price in against growth? And you've seen these bubbles and these capitalism cycles. Where are we today? Well, you got a couple of analogies that either way can unfold. If you go back 
not that long ago, in the 1940s, we were coming out of a war. People worked, saving money, and there was a surge in demand for goods and housing that was pent up, washing machines, refrigerators. I don't even remember what the TV sets were around at the time. But bottom line, prices for goods accelerated sharply. And then they calmed down, and then we had a very good long run of economic activity with low inflation. The second observation would be the 1970s when you had wage increases trying to catch up. Remember, we had an oil shock and raised the price of oil. And we had lines, gas lines, and that happened again in 1981. And so during that period, you had a surge in inflation. Economic policy was uninspiring. Uh, financial policy was uninspiring. Uh, and then Volcker came along and said, we've got to bite the bullet. So I don't know which one we have. I think a lot of the surge in, uh, in goods it will slow down. But wages, uh, price, uh, Randy, I went out and filled up my car before I had the flat tire, not today. Uh, basically, uh, I got regular and I got it by paying cash so I'd get the 2% discount at this particular station, but it was still $5 a gallon. It is a very regressive tax. Think about fuel. One of the individuals that I met the other night said his son went into a place to get a bagel with cream cheese and the price was $4.50. The kid walked out. So we have to be practical and saying, you know, the Fed is finally acknowledging they're late in the game. Uh, and the impact of uh, two things, one, obviously, interest rate changes. But the second one is the Fed taking $9 trillion on their balance sheet and trying to deflate that. So we're trying to deflate the economy while they're looking at that monetary policy. Independent of that, the stock market is adjusting. You know, stocks like Peloton's, you know, you keep going on and on. Chewy. Uh, uh, and so on. Or yesterday, another one that dropped from 25 to 10 to uh, 13 this morning. You know, you're adjusting in the market. And Mr. Market is adjusting. The one difference between my investing and the, and I didn't do it in the 40s, but I was an investor in the 50s, 1950s and uh, 70s, is that every economic cycle, including oh, oh, us, 1999 and 2000, you didn't have these ETFs that could just short, 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 sell, sell, sell. They eliminated the uptick rule. An uptick rule meant that you couldn't short unless the stock had some stability uh, by going up in price. And that was done. I can't tell you whether it was done by uh, lobbyists for the ETFs, but it's done. And uh, the volatility on a day to day, the market dynamics, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting new phenomenon. One of my favorite articles ever written by Warren Buffett was in Fortune. And it was entitled, How Inflation Swindles the Investor. Do you remember that article? Uh, no, there's been so many that Warren reads. All you have to do is read his annual report or listen to the comments. But independent of that, I had a, the head of the Bundesbank in Germany who grew up in the 1900s and uh, 30s and 40s and understood what happened in the 1923 in Germany, wrote it very clearly. He was the head of the Bundesbank and he joined our board. The only board he did in the United States, he did some in Canadian boards, basically wrote, Think about toothpaste. When you get it out of the tube, do you think you'll ever get it back in? Inflation's the same way, Randy. You get it out of the tube, can you get it back in? And that's why you have to do what Volcker was able to do and what Powell is going to do. And, uh, you know, you got to tighten your belt. Uh, and the question is, what is the impact? The other part of the difference is the United States today is about uh, $25 trillion out of hundred and five trillion dollar global economy you know it's we've become a lower percentage so what is going to happen to europe next year what's going to happen to china when she gets past this uh lockdowns and all these other things and also gets reelected? and what is if and, and that he delays his own china one policy will the economies of 2023 support a slowdown in the u.s just like the u.s is helping temper the slowdowns in the rest of the world randy it's work in progress and you've got to connect these dots and you have to do the following. What do you do for an individual investor? And is he 20 years old and has a challenge uh, because he was in a car accident? Is he an 80 years old uh, individual that drives motorcycles? And uh, you, you're just, you have to customize what your thought process is and you can't do it with robots. 
<laughs> no, you can't. A robot does not ask you what a very simple question that we ask our clients for the last 50 years. What's your sleeping point? I like it. Yeah, if you worry about your net worth because the market's going down, we've got the wrong asset mix for you. And we will solve that problem thinking about you for the next 20 years or 10 years or 30 years of your time frame. It's a great perspective. In 1987, you issued a Magna Carta of shareholder rights. I would love to read it, and I'm sure my listeners would too. Where can we find that? Okay. Uh, uh, one of my teammates hopefully is listening, and she'll send it to you. But the background was the following. My British friends all know when King John signed it. They know it because it's 15 minutes after 12 o'clock after lunch. So 12.15, I'm, I'll check that number. It basically, it gave certain rights to those that were giving him advice. In 1986 or seven, and it's 35 years ago, so it's not that long ago, we owned shares of a company located in St. Louis, uh, in Chicago called Centel in the telecom area, which is an area that we have a lot of knowledge at the time. We thought the stock was worth somewhere around 70 or $75, well, private market value, materially higher than the price it was selling at. A group led by two friends of mine, Asher Edelman and George Lindemann came along and try to start a proxy fight or somehow get involved in a way that they would like to pay a materially lower price than what we consider private market value. So given the nature of the way we think, and given that I was the head of the auto analyst of New York and the head of the entertainment analyst back in the 60s and early 70s and have a CFA degree, chartered financial analyst degree, I said, why don't we invite institutions that own the stock to come to a meeting and share their ideas about what's going on. And we did it at the old Bear Stearns, uh, probably fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh floor, whatever they allowed us to do it for no charge. Uh, basically, as the meeting ended, I got subpoenaed because I, in quotes, was conducting an illegal proxy fight. And I took it. I said to George, good luck. And he said, you know, you I said, you're trying to intimidate me. It's not going to work. So he dropped it. But I came up with the idea that a priori, we will announce to the world what we stand for. For example, we don't like companies that put in poison pills. We like the fact that if you have a cumulative voting, we're not gonna vote against it. Uh, we don't like you to put cumulative voting in. And just so that you'll see that, and that's what we call the Magna Carta of shareholder rights. I wanna to segue towards the state of capitalism. You've been very proactive in referencing Ricardo and comparative advantages. Obviously, Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand and Specialization, Keynesian Economics on the demand side, Friedman on the money supply, and that interesting thing, the social responsibility of business is to increase profits. Now there's this new concept of stakeholder capitalism that Klaus Schwab brought out with profit with purpose. Between your Magna Carta for shareholders and the evolution of capitalism that's happening now in the marketplace, what should I expect and what should our listeners expect five, 10 years from now? Yeah, I kind of refer to a cousin, not mine, by the name of Darwin. <laughs> and Darwin had a great line as well that you like to quote. It's not the strongest that survive. It's not the smartest. It's those that are most flexible. The beauty of capitalism is that it evolves. When Ricardo came up with the idea of growing cork in, Spain, in uh, Portugal for goods uh, like textiles in London because each had a comparative advantage. That is, they can produce it more efficiently and they should just swap it. You know, we go through cycles. We're going to now onshore. We're going to bring back manufacturing. We're worried about the cost of goods, the number of ships off Shanghai, even though they may be coming down now because of the lockdown. You know, uh, the world re reacts. The beauty of uh, a methodology of a free market system with all the flaws of allocating capital is that it serves the customer. My first time to Budapest was right after the Berlin Wall came down. I didn't go before. And uh, I said to the guy on the Danube, is looking up the Danube River there, and I was looking up and I'm saying, what is that? He says, well, the Russians are building a steel mill. I said, you know, that's interesting. Can, we, uh, can I borrow your phone? I want to call my office. No cell phones. He says, we don't have phone service. Uh, if you do tops down asset allocation, you make a lot of mistakes. Okay. And so one has to take a very practical approach and the companies have obligations to their owners, but they also have to think about the uh, part of society that they're a part. However, you can't make a rule for a company that has a small, tiny business growing and make the same rule for a large company. 
as Section uh, 202 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is an example. Uh, the cost of implementing and maintaining it and monitoring is not only the out-of-pocket cost, but the time involved that can be put to more useful rules. And Gary Gensler is doing a great job at the SEC. Uh, he's got a lot of issues. You know, I just need to worry about the cost of implementing these. And <laughs> contingent lawyers will make it more expensive if you don't check the right box at the right time. You took uh, Gabelli Asset Management public in 1999, and uh, you went public selling 6 million shares. I would have thought that would have been a celebration of life, but you've later said that you wish you would have never taken your company public. Is it because of the regulatory cost burdens? Well, let's go back to the moral obligation that I had. Yes. When I started the firm, nobody would join me because they needed income, and we did it from, I made $5,000 with three and a half kids or three whatever at that time. The problem is that I had partners that came on and we gave them stock because we wanted to share, you know, pull the oars in an order. We were buying and selling at book. I think Merrill Lynch went public prior to us. Newberger and uh, Goldman went afterwards. So we said, we think we should look at what is the value of our enterprise in the public market so that our holders can buy or sell. We never sold any stock. I have not sold any stock. I've given it to charity, but not sold stock. The 6 million shares were an IPO that took us from 24 to 30 million shares. Okay, we've tried to buy most of that back and we will continue to do that. The cost of being public are high. We have, don't need the capital. We know how to raise capital without going to the markets. So the question is, is it right to remain public or should, and what are the benefits? And uh, that's an ongoing debate. Uh, clearly, uh, we're public, and obviously, uh, we have a moral obligation to our partners, those shareholders, much the way Warren Buffett calls them. And to the degree that we're buying stock back, we give liquidity to the system, they get out of the, uh, uh, and he articulated buybacks and the virtues of them as opposed to some politicians that think they're morally wrong or whatever they think. Uh, you know, there are reasons, if you're buying it back to support the price of stock, Randy, that's not good. If you're buying it back because you got stock options and you want to sell it, that's not good. If you're buying it back to maintain an earnings model growth rate like AutoZone is doing or O'Reilly, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, if you're buying it back because it's cheap and it's below intrinsic value, that is what is it worth? And it adds value with, and that's what Buffett's timing was. Well, before we get to the philanthropy and the giving pledge component of our conversation, I just want to ask you maybe a question or two about real estate because that's where I spend most of my time today. How does a value investor look at real estate as an investment, whether that's public or private? You know, Charlie Munger, for example, in his most recent conversations at the Daily Journal annual meeting, he said his favorite four investments in order were Berkshire, Amazon, Costco, and multifamily dwelling units. But we know that real estate is cyclical and it's really hard to interpret and then you look at the corporates and you look at their property plant and equipment as a potential equivalent real estate allocation for a corporation and they're maximizing its utility. And as time goes on, the replacement costs become higher and higher. So from your perspective, I know that you've looked at Fortune Brand Homes, for example, as a reference. And in your Graham and Doddsville back in 2011, that interview you were talking about widgets and how they would potentially increase during the construction expansion period post GFC or the global financial crisis. So real estate is a nebulous one. And I would love for a value investor like yourself to opine if you can. You would have asked me the same question in 1624 where you, if you and I were Dutch settlers uh, buying the island of Manhattan, <laughs> I think we've made 7% compounded rate of return uh, over 400 years. Uh, look, the one element that you don't have included is taxes. The real estate lobby has done a very good job of allowing people to take a gain on, the, on real estate and replacing it with another piece of real estate under a section, in quotes, 1031. Uh, secondly, the tax rules are such that there are significant benefits on your cost basis to real estate. Uh, now, hold those aside. What is the value of cash flow? The value of cash flow is the multiple you pay for it, which is a function of interest rates. So if you take a million dollars that I promised you 10 years from now and tell you that interest rates are 1%, you'll pay me uh, $9.5 million today. But if I tell you interest rates are going to 8% and that 10 million is constant, you're going to pay me 6 million. 
Same thing with real estate. What parts of the real estate world have pricing power? And what are the elements that change in real estate? And what are, the, in quotes, location, location, location? Is it Nashville? Is it Austin, Texas? Is it, uh, you know, Memphis? Uh, is it Nevada? And uh, what are the elements that go into that? And then where did people move? Now, you had, a, because of COVID and crime, a great flight from cities, and you moved into various locations. So then you're going back to New York. Real estate prices in the city of New York are rising substantially. And expertise in that area is something that we have as a core competency not developed. So as a result of that, we know the macros. And so we go in and say, okay, who's done a good job? And we buy public companies where the managers have proven their skill sets or if you believe, uh, like St. Joe Paper, the real estate they have in the Florida Panhandle is extremely valuable over the next 20 or 30 years. You can buy the stock today at $45. There's an individual that has now increased his ownership to 48%. He's taken a shares count down from 100 million to 60. And so you look at say, maybe I should do that. And so we find and have public companies that we're buying uh, as opposed to buying direct or through LPs as an LP or through opportunity zones, which you know is another tax dynamic that are certain moral obligations and pluses and minuses. Let's finish up with our final topic, which is philanthropy. And I kind of want to view this as value investing with or through philanthropy, because I still think you're doing a huge value add to society. And we're talking about moral obligations. For our listeners, um, some of you might not know that Mario has, through his foundation, made lots of investments uh, in allocations and donations, even to the University of Nevada, Reno. And if I'm not mistaken, even here in Las Vegas to Bishop Gorman, I believe. Is that correct, Mario? Uh, no, uh, about 30, 40 years ago, somewhere there was an individual that lived in the Bronx that had a common stockbroker and he moved to Reno. I went there in the late 60s. I then somewhere in the 80s, got involved with a foundation there called the Wiegand Foundation. Mr. Wiegand was a Canadian Yankee inventor, moved out to Reno and liked how people handle their own lifestyles. If you spilled coffee on yourself, don't sue somebody. You know, that kind of an approach. So they are, he asked this organization and it was run by an individual for the last 40 years. Her name is Kristen Avancino. She just got hit by a car two weeks ago in San Francisco and died. Mm, she is sorry. an outstanding woman, an outstanding leader, a standing philanthropic person who headed up that and gave the money to those schools in Nevada. And uh, she just died. So in any event, that's how I got involved in Gorman. UNR, same thing. We again put up a center at the UNR and I uh, was willing to take on this first gen a, a school that uh, 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 appeals to the first generation of uh, individuals and put in some money for the plaza there. In fact, we just hired an individual that grew up in Nevada and grew up in Las Vegas and is now at UNR as a sophomore to our office in Reno. And she's fantastic, okay? She's only been with us three days and I know it. And I found her at a Horatio Alger dinner in Washington, D.C., where she was the beneficiary of her scholarship. So that's how we uh, found that. Uh, but schools like the University of Miami, we have an endowed chair. We did something with uh, Rashudi at, down at uh, Tulane, uh, something at uh, Case Western in uh, Cleveland, uh, you know, kind of because how do I give back? Obviously, I went to Columbia Business School, Fordham, and so on. Uh, Boston College, Rhode Island, University of, uh, uh, in Rhode Island called Roger Williams. And there's a whole bunch that we want. And Pace University. I mean, there's a lot. I own this next on the calendar. So what we want to do is to help individuals first gen. And what does the school need? What does a hospital need? Let's stay with the schools. They need faculty. They need facilities. They need to get students and students need some help. And so as a result of that, we try to help. And uh, that's the ba background uh, of the foundation based in Reno, Nevada. Well, thank you for that explanation. And we will give honor and reference to Kristen Avancino. Yeah, she was on the the uh, the, uh, uh, the newspaper, the Reno Gazette had a story about all she accomplished and her great accomplishments, and they were on the cover. Amazing. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing that. 
So you were also a signator of the Giving Pledge on October 2nd, 2017. Uh, very appropriately, you quoted Vince Lombardi. And you said, the measure of who we are is what we do with what we have. What do you want to be remembered by, Mario? I don't, uh, there's no need to remember me, but there is a need for uh, what Warren Buffett put in his annual report. By the way, Lombardi went to Fordham and that's how I remember that when he was a <laughs> great football coach. Uh, I think what you have to do is look out and my parents came over, they didn't go past the sixth grade. How do we get somebody to succeed, whether it's Ken Langone or Joe Mowgli or uh, the, all of those individuals that are on the Giving Pledge or Horatio Alger? And basically, you want to give back. And so that's what we do. Now, I, it's a question of timing. <laughs> and that is you want to match up what you have. And so we want to create a legacy in the foundation uh, much like other organizations, and you, you can, whether it's Hershey, Kellogg, and so on, uh, Ford Foundation, I, there's too many. And then what happened is I'm inspired by what Buffett has done and what Bill Gates has done, and uh, basically want to be part of their team effort. Our whole theme this year on the podcast is about attainability making education more attainable, um, housing more attainable, or making investments more attainable. Is there anything that you could share on attainability or how you would define attainability? Because I think that really showcases in the philanthropy work that you do. Yeah, I look, I want individuals starting in grammar school, but I'll settle with high school to understand what it means to handle their financial matters. That's an important first step. Others have done a much better job of implementing it. The second part is that from my end, I have allowed machine, uh, equipment to go into schools uh, when I ask and sometimes I ask and they say, can't do it. Uh, so we try to put Bloomberg machines in the colleges so that they have access so that they, it's a tool of learning, uh, data gathering. And we have helped fund the student uh, activities by giving money Randy, to the amount of money. So it, it's not just conceptual. They're really dealing with money and the university gets mm. the proceeds. So that's one part of your question. And the second part is obviously uh, a need to help first gen. And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, you have to be careful because you want people to succeed with success. And uh, I believe, uh, you know, all are created equal and therefore you want to help everyone get the same advantages. And obviously uh, individuals that are second, third gen of students are, are, have a, letter, a better advantage. So how do we level that playing field? And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, that's how I got involved with a school in uh, Massachusetts called Salem State. They appeal to first gen and uh, we're doing more of that. Well, thank you very much for signing that giving pledge. And thank you very much for being with us today on this podcast. Randy, you have done an exceptional job of digging into the details of what you're going to talk about. I do a, a many of these, and I commend you for your work and, your, uh, and the uh, focus of your questions. So thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.